Good morning everyone and welcome to Northern Institute's People Policy Place Seminar Series 2021. My name is Katrina Britnell and I'm the Partnerships Coordinator with Northern Institute. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. For Kirsten and I at the Northern Institute in Darwin, it is the Larrakia people. We pay our respects to Larrakia elders past, present and emerging and further extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Today we have Associate Professor Kirsten Zander presenting. Kirsten is an environmental economist with a background in agricultural science. Her research looks at the many relationships between humans and nature and aspires to increase human well-being and sustainability while helping people cope with changing environments and natural hazards. Kirsten is going to be sharing her research insights around the social and economic impacts of heat in Darwin and Australia. Welcome Kirsten and I'll leave you to take it away. Yeah, thank you Katrina for the introduction and Hello everybody, welcome to my seminar. First of all, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Larrakia land on which I am here and most days these days. And also I would like to um, respect, uh, pay my respect to elders both past and present and emerging. So the outline of my presentation today will be <clears throat> a global overview to the, uh, first of climate change and climate change related heat increasing heat, then talk about heat research in Australia, and then going down to Darwin and implications for Darwin, heat impact and adaptation. So global warming or climate change. So we are basically, the summary of this slide is we are all stuffed and a target of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level, which has been decided at the, at the Paris Agreement, cannot be met. Most scientists these days are quite sure about it and even a two degree increase above this level, these in industrial levels um, is most, most likely will not be achieved as well. But it's really still good to hang on to a target, although we can't meet it. So otherwise nobody would do anything anymore. But mind um, you like, it is, um, yeah, most science these days say that we are actually achieving these limits earlier and these um, tipping points earlier than expected. And um, I, while my seminar isn't about the impacts of climate change, I just wanted to alert you that it's, it will be bad. And for instance, every one degree uh, more, warming will cause 2.3 meters of sea level rise. At two, uh, at two degrees warming above the 1.5 target, they most likely kill uh, all living corals in the world. That's just some aspects of it. So it all comes down to heat itself. And heat, most people, like in the media, it's all about heat waves. So heat waves are increasing worldwide, not only in Australia, with it also wildfires, flood, droughts, all these severe um, weather events. Um, some of them are only getting more frequent, some also more severe, but less frequent. And heat waves, depending on the definition of, is like a few days in a row, more than 38 degrees. And it, yeah, you, in the media, we can, um, read about the heat waves in Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne a lot. In Darwin, the situation is a little bit different. We don't have the heat waves as, it's, it themselves, like as per definition. Otherwise, we had to have heat waves most six months of the year, but with us, it's just the increasing average temperatures. But I will get to that a bit later on. So, and also in the, in the last five years, heat has become a really strong issue in the media worldwide. I like this one in particular, um, um, an article in The Guardian from two years ago, saying that heat will be the next big inequality issue. Just to give you a bit of an overview, in 2003, a heat wave in Europe killed 74,000 people, 30,000 in France alone, and mostly old older people. The heat wave in Adelaide in 2009 killed 300 people, 
but since then many more have died <coughs> in smaller heat waves, but more frequent heat waves. In 2010, in Russia, 56 people died directly because of the heat wave. 2015, there was a big heat wave in India and Pakistan, killing at least 4,500 people, but that figure is most likely very underestimated. So the impacts of heat, it's mostly about health and some direct impact. It's not only about mortality, but it's a general decline in well-being. People just feel sweaty, which is not bad, doesn't kill you, but people just feel unwell. They are they get headaches, they have fatigue, nausea, dizziness. Like these are the slight uh, light impacts. And most of these impacts can be countered with um, like drinking a lot and seeking shade and so on. And then they have more severe symptoms and they can lead to heat strokes and death and fainting, muscle cramps, confusion, confusion seizure and unconsciousness. Then you have indirect impacts of heat, increasing heat, that's bad sleep. And I'm sure everybody knows that, although you sleep in air conditioning and the sleep is not as good and that can lead to further um, um, compromising of the health system, or people's immune system and other diseases. And also like uh, indirectly more mosquito transmitted diseases get to places that have been too cold before. So you have a um, wider pattern of disease reaching areas where they are not used to that disease. And then there's also a lot of research on the economic impacts of it. Um, and I'm not dealing with that in my research per se, but the direct impacts are on agriculture mostly, reduced crop production, um, reduced livestock productivity. Livestock in down south in Victoria and so on, farmers actually have to spray their cattle when they come in for milking, which might be a problem if you have only limited water availability. Um, then, yeah, you have also direct impact on the infrastructure and on very, very hot days, you have actually just a um, tarmac melting roads melt, yeah, roads melting, train tracks melting, um, power lines melting, and especially in countries that are not used to the heat. They have, um, also in Europe, they have a very big problem with that. And that the indirect impacts of, economic impacts of heat are the rising energy costs. Everybody knows that. It's not just to cool your own house, but also the governments to cool schools and, and, and um, buses and, and transport and, and systems and also um, private business to cool shopping malls and so on. Then you have a higher cost for building because you need a certain standard to actually withstand the heat. So higher cost for materials. Then another indirect impact is like some people might not, uh, not want to go to places that are too hot for tourism. So some countries or, or regions might miss out because of uh, Also big in the media sometimes are these so-called climate change refugees. While this term is a bit alarmistic, um, it's still happening. Like a lot of people are moving anyway because most people in the world, um, if they have the freedom to move and the money to move, they move for economic reasons. They're going for new jobs. They move to join family. And but an, a recent study showed that every additional one degree warming over the 1.5 target will either display a billion people or force them to live in unsufferable heat. So basically they live in areas where normally people shouldn't be living. And these countries that are, expect the highest migration flow because of heat or climate, it's not only heat, these are in the most populated countries in the world and also the poorest, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Indonesia, Sudan, and so on. That's, um, and the only reason Australia is not on this graph is because there are not enough people. Yeah, so heat and climate will be a big issue for climate migration as well. And I will talk about this a little, a little bit later, migration as an adaptation strategy to heat. 
So a lot of heat research has been done in Australia, mostly by a mob in Adelaide, Brisbane, and Sydney. A lot of case studies looking at, again, the direct impacts of heat on mortality by counting the excess death during heat waves. That's the easiest um, way to do it. And there are a few case studies from Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney, or the effect on, um, of heat waves on mental health, the effect of heat waves on pre-existing disease, such as renal and cardiovascular diseases. And there are even two studies from the NT, or even one from Darwin. Um, Webb et al. 2014 used data from the four big hospitals in the NT, from indigenous and non-indigenous people being admitted to hospital, and they found that on very hot days, um, the indigenous people are more likely to be admitted to hospital because of um, heat-related disease, especially heart and renal diseases. A study by James Goldie et al. from Darwin, they, he used data from the Darwin Hospital, and he found that not only on very hot days, but also on very hot, humid days, and also days where the previous, on the days um, when the previous day was very humid, that's when most people are admitted to hospital in Darwin because of heat-related disease. So it's not in Darwin, it's not just heat, but it's also the humidity, and that shows this lag effect. So it could be one day it's very hot and very humid, but the effect on the human body is often only um, felt a day or two after, and that's when people go to hospital and have severe symptoms. Then there are a few studies across Australia, again, mostly case studies from down south, on the economic issues related on health provision. That's the economic evaluation of public health adaptation strategies from Brisbane. Uh, cost of additional ambulance call out during heat waves. There is a massive spike on very hot days or during heat waves um, for yeah, ambulance call out. And cost of heat related occupational accidents. If people and that's all mostly on in industries like construction, mining, agriculture, where people are very active outside. Um, and when they feel heat stress, they get um, yeah they get they concentrate less and and they get maybe fatigue and they have more accidents, which is also a huge economic cost to the industry and also to the health of people. So. The, and there's a, there's a social impact of heat, and less research has been done in this area. Um, a paper by Stephen et al. from Australia showed that the, a link, a positive link between heat and aggression, increased aggression and violence. And there are very few Australian wide studies on well being and the socioeconomic impacts of heat. And two of the studies were run by, by CDU. We run one study. In an online study in 2014 and one in 2017, both with a random sample of 2,000 people. And in 2014, while well, about half of the people, the respondents felt at least sometimes heat stressed. In 2017, this um, share was up to 78%. So they're already in three years, the same questions, the same random sample, people feel hotter than, they, than before. And I'm going to talk about the results of these two surveys a bit in a bit more detail. One study in 2014 was actually on the economic impact through the labor productivity loss. So people, we call that presentism, people go to work, but they probably had very bad sleep the previous day, or they, they have a long wait to work, maybe in a public transport, in the heat, they have to wait for buses and so on. So while even if they work in an air-conditioned environment, it's, a t um, it's important to look at what they're doing outside work because that's when you get heat stress. So for instance, after a weekend of just fishing and drinking beer, in the extreme case, like, or just partying and not drinking enough water, you feel really heat stress on Monday morning. So you go to work, people might go to work and then they fail just, they don't, they're not at the 100% capacity to work. And that actually happens to many chronic disease. And we estimated that, um, so 10, on average, across all the respondents, everybody would go like lose 10 full days per year, working days. And in total that came, 
come up to like seven billion people per uh, billion dollars per year that's lost due to labor productivity loss and um, while a few people like 25 percent of people compensated actually for their loss of being you know, less productive during the work by actually working longer hours which then might decline well-being because you want to go home and see family and so on especially people who actually are self-employed they don't have the luxury of just not working as much as they should could um, so they just work more longer also what we found is that it's not only people in like mining industry and agriculture and, and construction that are heat stressed but no it's people who sitting inside in the offices making decisions and our study and that, and that has been also found previously people feel like they make, make actually bad decisions and that can if you're running a multi-dollar business that can actually be really bad so we found that the highest loss is actually among managers and so on. And um, yet most research is on these outdoor um, labor intense jobs and sectors. And then there's like, um, so much less research in the adaptation field than the impact field. And that we find that all over like climate change research actually. Um, you know, the impacts very well, but we don't really know how people adapt and cope. So adaptation to heat, we did one study and, and not surprisingly, most people just drink, rest, seek shade, swim, shifting working times, which could be a problem with noise and so on. You can't just start digging, or, you know, like construction work at four in the morning in a residential area. But then people can at least in their leisure time also shift times for sports, walking the dog and so on. And also something very easy and cost effective is like wearing light clothes and less formal clothes. And there's a personal and a personal behavior area you can adapt, but you can also adapt how you live and at home. While most a lot of people just switch on the air conditioning, there is also something called passive cooling. They use the design of the housing to provide shade for um, for instance by planting trees, the orientation of the house, the ventilation, the windows, insulation, that all can contribute to a cooler home. And while we all wanna live in a tropical house, like this picture, a lot of people said they live in a little concrete box because it's very expensive to build a tropical house here in Darwin. And also social housing and so on, they tend to be a sealed box and you can only live in it when you use air conditioning 24 hours. And it's very expensive to retrofit your home as well in your garden. So you could, there's something like heat reflective coating, painting, and that you could use. But again, that's very expensive. And a lot of people so in our surveys, very few people actually use their design in the house to adapt. Again, I, I talk about that a bit later. But the good news is, like everybody actually can adapt to heat. And this is a major leg of research actually because in, in the sport science for instance a lot of research is being done on how sport people professional athletes how they adapt to heat so if there's olympic games in a very hot country the athletes they they um, prepare months before and train in that heat environment so they people say like you can um, it takes about one to two weeks um to get a used to the heat so by that you need to be at least two hours in the heat every day to get used to it and everybody unless you are very old and maybe sick you can adapt and most newcomers to darwin they don't know that a lot of people they come a short-term contract two three years they don't know that they, their body can actually adapt they spend the whole day in air conditioning their office is aircon their car is aircon they don't actually allow that being exposed to heat for two hours a day for two or three weeks to get that effect. And that's why we need a more awareness raising. And once your body is actually used to it, you can lose that effect as well. And that's a problem with the fly in, fly out people. They get used to it for a few weeks then they fly back into a cold climate and then they need another two weeks to get adapted to it. But once, if you live in Darwin long-term and you are adapted, then usually the effect should hold on and your whole well-being should be <clears throat> higher my theory and 
Yeah, so why are we actually now going to come down to Darwin? Because, um, yeah, Darwin is a really interesting case for heat research. And the reason we do it here, it's not only because we live in Darwin, but it's, it's a, also a perfect example because what we can hear, learn here from the tropics is applicable for so many regions in the world. A third of the world's population actually live in the tropics. And that's the latitude lines of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn in between. So most people live there already and the share is increasing. And also most, a lot of people, like 50% of the world population live in, in the urban areas, which are, which are also very hot and a lot of urban tropical areas that are increasing, the fastest increasing areas in the world. Um, so whatever you learn here can be really used in another context. And again, if you look at this graph here, like that was um, 2020, and the red um, shades are the days that were hotter than normal, normal, you know, normally on average over the last whatever years when since the temperature has been recorded. And nearly 60% of all days in Darwin were hotter or much hotter, so either bright red or orange. Where a few days were also cooler, but much less, as you can see here. And it only really started to cool off in December. And since then, it has been quite coolish. But um, it's going to be like this. That's how it's going to be probably most years since now. And also, um, a CSIRO report, they predicted that in 2030, there will be 44 days over 35 degrees. Again, we already have average of 33, 34. So it's not a big deal, but in the, by 2070, that's predicted to be 227 days. So most the whole day year will be hotter than 35 degrees. So it's like one big long heat wave. And so, Together with the demographic team here at another institute, with Andrew Taylor and his mob, like we did, a, they did a territory and me survey, and they're trying to find out how to get people in, to Darwin, how to re retain them, how to attract them, how, and so on. And we were think, talking, and we were thinking, well, uh, the climate and heat is a big issue actually for a lot of people. So part of that. A territory and me campaign we we ask a few questions about heat adaptation how people adapt and um yeah we the shocking or not so surprising results were that or that um, there were about 700 responses i think all people living in darwin um 65 percent just use air conditioning more frequently and a lot of those people is that their only strategy and we did a text analysis and that's a, the word cloud is showing it's air conditioning comes up all the time. And also what was a bit shocking was that you know, other adaptation strategies again, like staying inside, seeking shade and the usual ones, but young people were more likely to stay inside as well than older people. And th th this is a picture for like, that's how, most cities also in Asia look like. That's a picture I took in Manila somewhere. The problem of over-reliance on air conditioning is, again, it makes the cities much hotter, the uh, urban heat island effect. It actually reduces your own ability to get used to the heat. And also, so it creates all sorts of health problems like bad sleep, like you get dry eyes, dry skin, all allergic, all allergies can be um, heightened by using air conditioning right now. Um, and also what the survey also really showed is there's a big equity issue in heat adaptation in Darwin. So while people all said they use air conditioning more often, and going back to my first slide, that's a, one of the indirect impacts of the economic impact. So the electricity bills are very high for many people and that came up together um, air conditioning and builds came up in the text analysis together a lot. And also what came up is solar panel installation. So those people who are lucky enough to first of all own a property and then to be able to afford solar panels, they don't really mind so much. They use a solar energy, cheap solar energy to power their air conditioning 24 hours, or at least by night. 
And yeah, 20% of the respondents, they mitigated the high cost of air conditioning by installing solar panels. And renters are disadvantaged, again, like all these people in their boxes are disadvantaged, although they might not pay the full electricity bills. But um, yeah, it's uh, like showing that um, it's a matter of money actually to adapt to heat and that's only getting worse. And also having pools and so on and, and not everybody can afford that and rent is increasing anyway and then renting a place over the pool and so on. And that was my, well, yeah, we were hoping to find out about the adaptation, how people adapt in Darwin. All we got is like, really, what are the problems with it, the, the limitations? And if it's all about air conditioning, it will be a huge yeah, equity issue. And I would like to talk about the migration as adaptation strategy as well. That's my last um, point, really. And, um, so like, again, it's a global problem, and but in Australia itself also there will be places that you can't live anymore in say 30 years, 50 years, or might also be in 20 years. And in the, in the past 20 years, Australia was big in these retirement movements. So people are um, moving to the sea, the sea changers or the tree huggers moving into the um, areas with bush, which are now might be pr more prone to fires and so on. And there was this whole yeah, movement of we love yeah, going where the climate is something positive, climate and weather <clears throat> and nature is so positive, people want to live right there. And now the research and people's attitudes are going in a different direction. So it's actually too hot. You know, all these um, cities along the East Coast where maybe retired people live and becoming so hot that one day they're not going to be moving there anymore. So as the climate year becomes more volatile and extreme weather events more frequent, it's changing from, yeah, natural hazards. It's actually a problem when, I, when people choose their locations to move to. And we had a study, again, an online study around this. And um, while the, most, the reasons to move are still all very much about economic and family issues, natural hazards then ranked actually after these issues. They ranked before um, amenities, before even um, essential care, like health care and, and education and so on and schools. So that's gonna, and, and again, this is gonna be a, a major, not like the main reason for most people, but it's always there, um, climate and, and natural health incidents when people make location choices. And another study of, um, we did um, was in 2016, where we, an Australian wide study, where we asked people directly, are you intending to move to cooler places because you feel heat stress where you are? And um, there was 70% of the sample of you know, about 2,000 people said yes, they really make already um, plans to move somewhere else, um, which is, it's not too high, but realistically, and, um, but the figure got really, increased a lot among young people and young people who were male people who uh, men who worked in in um, labor intense industries so if you're a construction person or something like this you don't want to really work in or live in areas that are very hot and that again can can lead to labor shortages in areas that are very hot so darwin already has a labor shortage skilled labor shortage and, and people don't want to come here because the job they're doing is so intense and outside and they know about the problem of heat. Although you can use, get used to it, there's still a limit for your body that you can't cope. And another study we did in Darwin was, um, and again, yeah, yeah, the reason we did that study is to understand why people leave and what to do to keep them in Darwin. So if they're happy, if they're not heat stressed, they're likely to stay on and bring their families and so on. And so we conducted another study in October 2019, the latest one, and, and we distributed 4,000 hard copy questionnaires across the greater Darwin region. And in Darwin alone, doing research is very hard for an online survey or so on because the sample is very small, the sample frame. So we 
distributed these surveys and then people had the choice of either doing it online or mailing back the questionnaire we got a reasonable response rate of about 18 percent 700 responses and the question was really there would you leave or are you intending i know it wasn't that we use the stated preference methods uh, like a best worst scaling where we ask respondents to trade off different reasons for why they would move or leave darwin so um and this graph shows that why again employment family and friends and lifestyle issues are the most important reasons one is the most important ten the least important um, especially for young people the middle aged people heat comes in there as a third reason already after family and employment but then when you look for the at the older segment of the population in Darwin heat ranks number one so if older people leave then it's because of heat and that's um yeah it's not surprising because a lot of people want to retire in a cooler place but it's still shocking how heat came up as such a big issue and you want to keep or Darwin want to want to keep uh, the older generation they have a wealth of traditional knowledge like like knowledge um um like like um, volunteer work like like older people are such a um valued um segmentation a segment of the population so you don't want to lose those people and often if the older people once they are retired move back down south or something they might take their families with them so yeah, that's really something where maybe Darwin should be working at the government on how to to provide heat mitigation strategies for the older people otherwise they might all leave if they can yeah so that was my last slide um Thank, hope that wasn't too short. Um, thank you for listening. And yeah, there's a lot of citations. Uh, and yeah, open for questions. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. I was just thinking maybe um, this has a lot to do with the fact that um, they're saying that uh, Tasmania house prices have gone up 30% in the last year. Yeah. Uh, everyone's moving to Tasmania. Maybe. Yeah, that can come up, comes up a lot when we ask about destinations where you would move to. Yeah, comes, Tasmania comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, we do have one question um, from Kelly, and she was uh, asking about your slide where you mentioned um, in order to adapt to heat continuous exposure. So she Hi. says, I'm wondering if the two hours of continuous exposure in order to adapt to heat mm -hmm. needs to be continuous or can it be two hours spread over the day? It's a good yeah. question. Good question. And I must say, I don't really know. That's, uh, I don't know. They just says ideally two hours every day. I, I honestly don't know how that works really. I, I can't imagine it's five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. I don't think that works really, but I can't. <laughs> that's too much medical, you know, research for me. I don't know. Um, sorry, but to be on the safe side, do it two hours every day, like in a row. <laughs> and uh, we have another question from Bernadette uh, saying, "And does the time of day make much difference? Like, do they need to be out between?" 12 and 2 or uh, or again I, I, just, uh, I haven't thought about that really but um, yeah I guess just exposed to heat so probably not it probably should be when it's hot mm. <laughs> but again sorry I don't know unless um, I should read about that a bit more in more detail we might look into it and put, put <laughs> yeah, yeah that's so interesting I really know about thought doing about that. yeah, yeah. Um, and we've got one more question. Can you point to any good work being done by a government or an organization seeking to address heat mitigation? Any good case studies beyond the work being done in Darwin at the moment? No, I, I don't think, um, I mean, there's a big Darwin living, so the living lab or something and the smart city program. So I think they are working on it. But it's mostly what the government do is like they um, their research or their their program is about 
making the city like climate smart. So it's the constructions of, you know, shades, like the stuff we have in Kavanaugh Street. And, and, but there are plenty actually of little case studies they have at the moment in Darwin where they look at the effectiveness, like shading pavements or water spray. So they are little, it's not only the Kavanaugh Street um, plant shading, but there are other um, little projects they have together with CSIRO and where they really look at the architecture and the building effect, but they don't look at people and how people adapt or it's good for people. They measure the heat that is um, the heat, less heat due or in that construction. Mm. The only thing that I would add there is that um, Matt Brearley, who's at the National Critical Care yeah, and Trauma yeah. Response Centre, yes, he does yeah. a lot of heat stress work. Mm. So that might be um, a good mm. area yeah. to talk to as well. He he's a uh, he's mm. an adjunct with the Northern Institute. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's true. And he looks so much like this picture here with the army people doing the ice immersion. Yes. With their arms. So he looks actually at the effects of these adaptation strategies like he but he focuses on like army and then a few other like firefighters and so on. And they did studies on on um, like control groups of firefighters coming from Adelaide compared to firefighters that are in Darwin and who's more heat. Um, I think yeah, with Elspeth so yeah. Opperman yeah. they did some work um, yeah. on mine sites. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. Yeah, and actually, we do have one more question. Yep. Why, uh, why tropical how? Why is tropical housing diminishing in the last two decades? Why can government cannot provide incentives for that? Mm. Oh yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I guess first of all, it was all about the cyclone coding, and and I read something that they wanna. Um, talk like like think about this because that's been there since Tracy and nothing has changed so that's why it became so also so um, expensive and and the houses the government then built and most people were just the little boxes but I think they are changing something about these um, certificates and cycling uh, coding and so on to make it easier or less expensive to build tropical but I think it's just the labor because there, there's so much more effort to build up than you sit down a little mm. one story um, house. And I mean, incentives, sure, they could probably go give like interest free loans and, and all that, but it's, I think it's just so much more expensive. Uh, it's hard to give. Yeah, uh, yeah, so in, incentives. And again, if you would get incentives, it's a bit like the incentives for putting up solar panels. You give incentives to those people who can already afford a house in the first place. Right. It's a vicious circle. And yeah, and the, for the social housing and so on, the government, sure. I mean, there have been studies also with indigenous communities. How do they want to live? And they want something open and so on. And then the government goes and builds a box. And I don't know why. It, and it's not even ex cheap. It's also expensive. And I don't know why that is. <laughs> okay. Um, that was the last question we have. So I just want to say thank you so much, Kirsten, for presenting for us today. Um, we had quite thank a few participants in the group, which was great. And I've put up your contact details. Um, and I'll also, if you go to the Northern Institute website, which is cdu.edu.au forward slash northern hyphen institute, uh, and go to the People Policy Place seminar page. Kirsten's PowerPoint will is already uploaded there. And we will be uh, editing this recording and uploading to our Vimeo and YouTube channels, hopefully in the next week or so. So thank you, Kirsten, for joining us. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. And please, yeah, contact me if you want to know more about any research. Thanks, Kirsten.